For exclusive products, content, and more, visit patreon.com slash revendelation. Found in the divine fullness of the heart of God in Christ is the revelation of a divine perspective that alone endures, even to death, and through which the nature and love of God is revealed to a dying world. The Divine Fullness of the Heart of Christ by John G. Lake Have you ever considered what the single greatest blessing is? Or the greatest revelation of the Spirit or the power of God? I believe the greatest thing is that Jesus showed the world how to exercise compassion for one another. The law of Moses that preceded Jesus was strict in its demands as all law is. That's the nature of law. But Jesus took it upon himself to reveal the Father's heart to the world. The greatest drive in the soul of God himself was that movement of compassion for a needy world. His compassion was so great that the word says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We're inclined to think sometimes that God doesn't care about the world. Not so. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. When the multitude had followed Jesus into the wilderness, he was moved with compassion for them, for they were like a sheep without a shepherd. The disciples said, Lord, let us send them away. Jesus understood men's humanity. He understood the fact that they were hungry, and the heart of Christ was moved with compassion for them. He said, No, get them to sit down. All there is in the group is 5,000 people besides women and children. You get them to sit down. When they were seated, he took the five loaves and the two fishes, blessed them, broke it, and gave to his disciples to give to the multitude. Jesus taught the world to have compassion. Men have loved to have compassion on the lovable and the beautiful. But Jesus taught the world to have compassion on the unholy, the sinful, and the ignorant. One day they brought him to a sinful woman, and they said, According to our law, she should be stoned. According to the law, there was nothing else for her. But the compassion of Jesus covered that soul, and he said, Go and sin no more. Someone told me this incident. A widow lady who lived in the country who had one daughter was working for very little wages. Her great ambition was to be able to educate her daughter. She had toiled and worked and invested the money in liberty bonds to hold for the education of her daughter. Recently, she came down from one of the country towns to Spokane to buy a few things that her daughter would need for her new life at school. She stood at one of the counters of the Crescent store. She turned her back for a moment and discovered that her purse was gone. Her whole life savings, the struggles of a mother's heart, the endeavor to give to the one big love of her soul in the education of her daughter. Even with the help of the officials of the store, she was unable to find it. Finally, she sat down and wept bitterly. A lady, the widow of a banker, saw her and told her to come up on the balcony with her and sit down. Another lady joined them, and the lady who first saw her said, 
We're going to sit down together and believe God on behalf of this soul. We are going to believe that God will move the soul of the person who took that little purse until his soul sees that thing the way this mother sees it. People are learning, blessed be God. And they sat down together to pray for that soul. The mother returned to the country, and in the mail following her came a letter with the little purse and a little note saying, I couldn't keep it. Forgive me, and may God forgive me. Compassion reaches further than law, further than demands of judges. Compassion reaches to the heart of life, to the secret of our being. The compassion of Jesus was the divine secret that made him lovable. Religious people are strict. Good people are strict. But good folks have to learn to exercise compassion just like others do. Remember the incident with the disciples and the Samaritans? The Samaritans didn't want Jesus and his disciples to come. They said, We've heard strange stories. How this thing happened and that thing happened. How a whole herd of pigs were drowned. They'd heard about the pigs, but they probably had never heard how the widow's son was raised from the dead. Or how the water had been turned into wine. The disciples loved their Lord. They were exercising His power. They were ministering to the sick. They were trying to alleviate the sufferings of the world. But still, that sense of insult was so overpowering that they said, Master, should we call down fire from heaven to consume them? My, how the big thing in your soul can get hurt. And how easy it is for us to make our own judgment rather than have the compassion of the Son of God. There's no limit to the compassion of Jesus. Two blind men were crying by the wayside, calling on the Lord to have mercy on them. He stopped and asked what they wanted. They answered, Lord, we want to receive our sight. And he healed them. And if you want the real explanation for his saving men out of their sins and sicknesses, it is in the love of his soul. That divine compassion of God and his desire to help men out of their sorrows and difficulties and back to God. Jesus' example on the cross is set forever and ever as the summit and the very soul of the compassion of God through Christ. After they'd pierced his hands and pierced his feet, with his last breath he prayed to God, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When a man is able to look on his own murderers and speak words like these, it shows that he speaks beyond what the human heart is capable of giving and is speaking only that which the soul of God can give. How long should we endure? How long should we endure the misunderstandings of friends without rejecting them? If we consider these things, surely we see the secret of the life that he endured all the way to the end and unto the very end. And also, in the very end, he was blessed by God. His triumph was there. The ignorant crucify you and trample over the loveliest things of your soul like they bruised the soul of Jesus. The triumph is there. Found in the divine fullness of the heart of God in Christ is the revelation of a divine perspective that alone endures, even to death, 
and through which the nature and love of God is revealed to a dying world. When Jesus was trying to give us balance in the life of God, he gave us, once more, a beautiful parable. The parable of the Good Samaritan. A man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him, left, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down that road. And one should have expected compassion from a priest. But when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And the Levite, the holy man of the people, came down, and he looked upon him and passed by on the other side. But the poor Samaritan, a dog in the mind of a Jew, when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him and whatever more you spend, I'll repay you when I come again. He didn't do the best thing, but he did the best thing he knew. And Christ commanded it. How often have you had the loveliest things of your soul walked upon? Not by some drunk stranger, but probably by one of the nearest to your heart. Probably by the one who should have understood more than any other. And can you see how we wound the soul of Jesus continuously through our lack of holy compassion? There's something mankind has never discovered and something they may never discover. That subtle something in the nature that can be touched and moved by divine compassion. It takes down the walls of our life and lets the divine love of God flow through our souls. How often you and I have stood or knelt by the side of the dying and diseased and have waited and prayed ineffectively until within our own heart something melted, something dissolved, and something richer than tears came from our souls. And by the grace of God, we saw the answer to our prayer before our eyes. It really is possible to contemplate something so much that it actually becomes a fact in your body. It's well explained by telling an incident from the life of St. Francis, who had contemplated the cross of Christ with such intensity, and that moved him so much, that he said to his followers, When I'm dead, open my body, and you'll find the impression of the cross of Christ on my heart. And sure enough, after his death, when they opened his body, there was the impression of the cross of Christ on his heart. There really is an inner life possible and an inworking of God. We can see the compassion of Jesus illustrated when he broke up a funeral procession one day as he passed along in that little city of Nain. It was a tender situation. The only son of his mother had died, and she was a widow. When Jesus looked on that procession, something broke loose in his soul. He stepped up to the little coffin moved with compassion and said, Young man, I say to you, arise. The sorrows of others moved the soul of Jesus and touched his heart. Lazarus, his friend, died. And four days later, the Lord went there. And hearing that he was approaching the village, one sister came to meet him. 
she said to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. The other sister poured out her heart to him in a similar manner. And eventually, he stood by the grave of his friend. And Jesus wept. Something terrific was moving in his soul. He said, God, I thank you that you always hear me. Then he yelled with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Once in South Africa, we were praying for a sick lady for a while without seeing any results. Then I said, I'll take my sister and go and pray for her. We prayed again and there was no victory. A day or two afterwards, we were down in the city in one of the large department stores. As we stood there, the Spirit of the Lord said to me, Go to her now. I said to my sister, As soon as you're through, we'll go over and pray for that sick lady. We went and I watched her writhe in pain and agony until I put my arms around her and cuddled her head close to my heart. And then, instantly, something broke loose in my soul. And then in one moment, I hadn't even started to pray. In one moment, she was lifted out of her agony and suffering. A divine flood moved her, and I knew she was healed. Then I laid her down on the bed, took my sister's arm, and we went away praising God. And here's one more story, and I want to give you this for your own help and blessing. I knew a man in South Africa who was an ardent Methodist. He had ten sons, all Methodist preachers, and three daughters, three beautiful daughters, holy women, a wonderful family, one of the most wonderful families I've ever known. The old gentleman had been stricken with disease, and he was in so much agony that there seemed to be only one way, and that was to drug him and completely desensitize him. As the years passed, he became addicted to morphine. He told me that he smoked 25 cigars, drank two quarts of whiskey, and used a large quantity of morphine every day. Think about it. So. The old man, until he was 73 years old, was drugged into senselessness most of the time. I prayed for him without stopping for 16 hours, without result. William Duggan, one of my ministers, hearing of the situation, came to my assistance. And I remember how he stood over him and prayed for him in the power of God. Somehow, there was no answer. I watched that man in convulsions until his daughters begged me to just let them give him morphine and let him die senseless rather than to see him suffer any longer. And I said, No. I made a promise to him, and I promised you too that life or death, we're going to fight this battle through. As I stood there seeing those awful convulsions, particularly in his old bare feet that were sticking out at the bottom of the bed, suddenly this came to my mind. He took our infirmities. And I reached out my hands and grabbed his feet and held them with a grip of iron. And that thing, that thing that is too deep for any form of expression that we know, broke out in my soul. And in a single moment, I saw him lie still, healed 
of God. Weeks later, I walked with him over his three estates, which had 50,000 orange trees and 50,000 lemon trees. And the old man told me about his love for God and of the richness of his presence. And I had my reward. If the church wants to be successful in their great exploit, that unspeakable thing that God wants that we need to do, It'll only happen when we enter into that divine fullness of the heart of Christ, the compassion of the Son of God. I made a promise to Him, and I promised you too, that life or death, we're going to fight this battle through.